what I've envisioned is a seed that is planted and it grows into a tree. And so the inspiration for that came from a Bible verse, actually, talking about Jesus describing his death. He said, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it will remain alone. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. What kind of made me really pursue civil engineering was hearing an introductory description of environmental justice. And in case you're not familiar with what that means, um, a lot of times there are certain communities that don't have the political capacity to avoid um, things like waste facilities, um, power plants that are fueled by coal or other um, fossil fuels, or even things like bus depots or other traffic features sited near their neighborhoods. And so it makes them more susceptible to environmental pollution. And um, hearing these challenges described for me the first time is really what made me pursue environmental engineering. In grad school, I studied a field called engineering and public policy, which looks at technology um, problems that have significant policy implications. The seed it stands for sustainable or strategic environmental engineering and decision making. I decided to look at infrastructure a little bit more broadly. And so we started using statistical models to predict, for example, pipe failures in drinking water systems. Um, looking at using statistical models to measure risk and then ultimately to describe the ways that we can make systems more resilient to failure. When we start talking about resilience, most of the time people look at the actual physical infrastructure system. If people recognize the impact of their voice, that people that are involved as collective in a community, that is, if they realize the impact of their voice in um, making sure that their systems will protect them when adverse events like hurricanes or earthquakes or things like that happen, if they understood that a lot of the resilience in the system in the, in the community comes about because of their belonging, their collective action, then I think that they would approach things differently from a community perspective. I keep looking over there because I keep a map on my wall of the world and I keep a map of the United States. So I'm looking at Flint while I'm thinking about that. There's a lot of things that go through my mind. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's a very complex situation. So complexity is the first thing that goes through my mind. Um, very close on the heels of complexity is, you know, is, it, are, is Flint being targeted in some way by the government um, because of who lives in Flint, right? And that's not necessarily fair because I was, I'll explain in a moment, infrastructure degrade over time. It's not like a, um, it's not like a gunshot where it's an acute kind of wound, but the system kind of degrades over time. For a number of political and economic reasons, the city of Flint decided to buy their water from a new supplier. And in the interim, uh, while that supplier was being prepared to deliver water, there needed to be a new pipeline constructed and so on. They decided to bring water from the Flint River into that distribution system. What ended up happening is that there's a lot of um, chemistry that had to change in order to use that water, caused the lead to leach into the water. Okay, and so there are a number of engineering factors, there are a number of social factors that led into that decision. All of these things combined to make the situation in Flint a real mess. And um, I just think it's really unfortunate because I don't know that, based on what I understand about the social factors and the economic factors involved, I don't know they needed to make the switch from Detroit. And so I just feel like a lot of the decision making was just not careful. And I'm sure that they would have made things, um, they would have done things differently if they lived themselves in Flint. So the people who made the decisions, that is, if they lived in Flint. scientists have traditionally hesitated to become involved in policy and in politics. But the fact of the matter is that scientists are citizens. They can't avoid advocacy. And so there's, I don't think it's credible or possible for scientists to avoid getting involved in the political process. Um, not only are they um, abdicating their responsibility as citizens to, um, to speak their voice, but, I mean, they're, they're, they, they are also going to be affected by the choices that are being made. They're the best informed. So why not get involved in the policy process? Why not learn the traditions? Why not learn um, the ins and outs of the policy process? Why not build coalitions and become members of those coalitions so that um, 
we are able to take actions that reflect the best science. I think when we start talking about sustainability, you can never underestimate how complex it is and how much it requires from us. And so, you know, when whenever we're talking about anything, whether it's, you know, um, pursuing new energy technologies, improving walkability of cities, um, you know, preserving cultural um, landmarks in, 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 you know, urban centers, those type of things, whatever it is, when we start talking about sustainability, it's very difficult. Um, we tend to underestimate the ways in which our lives will change if we want to pursue more sustainable ends. And so we really need to have honest conversations with one another about what needs to change about the way we pursue life. 